right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today we're going to be in uh, James chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 13 through 16. We're going to be here today. And so as we, as we get to James uh, chapter 3, verse 13, we're going to talk about how, uh, uh, like I always tell you, James has a series of tests. That's why we... That's why I chose James for the first book, because James is a series of tests to see whether or not, if we have that saving faith, to see whether or not are we authentically a Christian. And like we talked about before, James gives us a test as far as how we respond to trials, how we respond to temptations, how we respond to God's word, how we respond to uh, favoritism. Are we loyal to people? Do we put others above others? So James gives a whole series of tests. And last week we talked about the prayer. I'm sorry, I'm do this every week. Well, James what? <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for Luke Davis. Yeah, Luke Davis. <laughs> <laughs> now, James uh, 3. That's, I, I'm glad James wrote this. I need to more. Verses uh, 13 through 16. Appreciate it. Oh, my bad. 18. <clears throat> We'll go ahead. Uh, you want to read for you? All right, cool, cool, cool. 13 through 18. <coughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, Demonic, for where for where jealousy <coughs> and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. See, this passage of scripture gives us a test on where do our wisdom come from. And this passage of scripture immediately shows you where uh, the two ultimate areas where wisdom does come from. See, wisdom is a unique uh, uh, thing that God gives us. It's something that is an applied knowledge. Basically, uh, what we know, what we understand about different things in life, if we apply it, if it's good, it's called wisdom. And what James has given us here, he's saying, you know what? Wisdom is beyond intellectual. It's beyond your intellect. It's actually a little bit deeper. He's saying here he wants to show us that wisdom is in our behavior. Our behavior shows by which our uh, intellect stems from, by what we believe and how we really act in life. So let's get right into it. Uh, verse 13, we're going to go verse by verse. And the reason why we go verse by verse is because it protects me and it protects you. Like I always say every week, uh, if I go verse by verse, it shows you exactly what the word says. It protects me because I'm giving you exactly what God wants you to hear. And it protects you because whenever you hear a preacher or anyone say a certain scripture, you'd be able to be in the best position to say, okay, he's using it in context. Therefore, I can read 20 scriptures above it, 20 scriptures under it to make sure that that individual's using that scripture in context. So before I get into this passage of scripture, I want to let everyone know, especially those who are new, that James is a series of tests that shows whether or not if we're true believers. The first message that we talked about was the response to trials. How do we respond when we go through tough times? How do we respond when there's a death in our family, when we lose a job, or when we go through tough times? Our faith is revealed in those tough times to see whether or not we have enough faith to endure that trial. And the second test were temptations. How do we respond when we're tempted? Are we ones who consistently fall into temptations over and over again? Or are we people that says, you know what, this temptation is keeping me from a God who loves me. Therefore, if I have enough faith in me that believes in God, I will endure those temptations. The third test was uh, how we respond to God's word. When God's word approaches our life about a certain issue, do we accept everything that the word says? Or do we say, you know what, I only favor this side of the scripture. I don't really favor this because it doesn't appeal to what I believe. But are we open to every aspect of God's word? The other test was um, favoritism. Do we put people above others? Do we treat others better than others? Do we treat different races over other races? Do we treat people better who has money over the poor. How do we treat people? Last week we talked about the tongue. It's, a tongue is a result, actually I skipped one, uh, uh, our works. How are we bearing fruit? 
Are we really bearing forth love, joy, peace, patience? Are we bearing forth fruit that will prove that we have saving faith? And last week we talked about the tongue. How do we talk? If out of the mouth the heart speaks. What that comes out of our heart is a direct reflection of who we are as individuals. Today we're going to talk about wisdom. I'm going to read the scripture over again just to keep me up on uh, course. It says in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. But if you, are, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unscriptural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder or chaos and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good, and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in the peace by those who make peace. Let's look at verse 13. You see James is posing his first statement with a question. He says, who is wise and understand the money? He's asking this question because there's some type of confusion there. There's a lot of people who was wise. The Greeks were extremely knowledgeable. The Romans were extremely powerful. And the, and the Jews were, was strictly uh, disciplined individuals. And everyone thought these were wise people. They thought that these people obviously treasure a certain gift inside them that, that enables wisdom. But James is saying, hold oh, let's, let's let's look at it. Because he says, by his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. See, I'm going to read some scriptures out that talk a little bit about wisdom before I get real deep into this passage. If you have a pen, if you want to write these scriptures down, feel free. Uh, Proverbs 24, 14 says, Wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will, be, and your hope will not be cut off. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of the fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 2, 12 through 15. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse, who lead the straight paths to walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the per per perseverance of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. Proverbs 3, 13 through 14 says, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better in return than gold. Proverbs 23, 23 says, By the truth, by the truth, and by the truth, and do not sell it. Get wisdom, discipline, and understanding. Ecclesiastes 7, 19 says, Wisdom makes one wise man more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Ecclesiastes 7, 12 says, Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this, that wisdom preserves the life of its possessor. Uh, James 3.17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. We just read that. Uh, Job 32.8 says, it is, a, it is the spirit in a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding. Proverbs 8.35-36, for whosoever finds me, finds life, and receives favor from the Lord. But whoever fails to find me, wisdom, harms himself. All who hate me love death. Psalms 107.43, whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. The scripture gives us clear uh, knowledge of what wisdom is. A lot of people think that wisdom or the most successful people as far as the intellect are those who's on Wall Street, those with 20 or 40 some degrees after their name. A lot of people think that's wisdom, that these people are the knowledgeable ones of our society. These are the people that we should look up to. But James says that wisdom is beyond the intellect, is actually sown or evident in your behavior. Because yes, a person may be rich financially, but has a poor family. He's cheating on his wife. Is that man considered wise? <clears throat> a person who's a single man, successful in Wall Street, a multimillionaire, but strung out on drugs. Is this man considered wise? See, we have to take a good look in this passage of scripture to see what true wisdom is. Let's go to verse uh, 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. See, two of the main things that cause us to be uh, uh, concerned about this life is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Let's talk about jealousy. Jealousy streams from a heart that's bitter, a heart that's envious, a heart that covets, a heart that says, you know what, I want to keep up with the Joneses. 
I want to be in this place of fame. I want to be in this place of society. I'm jealous of my next door neighbor because they are, they are more advanced than I am. They have more accomplishments. They have achieved more than me. So I'm going to measure my life based upon their success, and I'm going to let my jealousy strive me to where they are. See, when it talks about bitterness, a lot of people are bitter out of anxiety, out of fear. A lot of people are bitter because of disappointments. A lot of people are bitter. They harbor this bitterness from when they was molested at eight or when they was abused at six. or They harbor these certain bitterness inside their heart to where that bitterness propels them to want to be someone better than who they are now. And that bitter jealousy is, is so deceitful because, yes, there's nothing wrong with achieving great things. There's nothing wrong with accomplishing things. But when it stems from or the conception of it is bitter jealousy, then the scripture lets us know later on what it produced. Let's talk about selfish ambition. Ambition of itself is not wrong. I have definitions here so we can get a clear understanding of what these words are. Uh, bitter jealousy, by definition, is resentfully or painfully desirous of another, another person's advantages or achievements. Selfish ambition. Let's look at the word ambition. Ambition is a strong desire to achieve something, typically requiring hard work and determination. Selfish is lacking consideration for others. So, when you look at that definition, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. There's nothing wrong with wanting to achieve greatness. There's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with, with aspiring to be great. But when that, that aspiration is built off of selfishness, and I'm doing it because I'm self-seeking, and I'm trying to be successful to satisfy my own needs, but I'm not being ambitious for God's glory. I'm not being ambitious to make sure that I'm doing everything parallel to God's purpose for my life. This is where we get dangerous. Let's keep reading. It says in verse 14, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. You see right here where most of the bitter jealousy and the selfish ambition stem from. See, many of us are unaware of how demons operate, how demons watch us, how demons take notes of our lives, how demons are very patient with us. They know exactly what, can call, what they can use to cause you to become better. They know exactly how to drift you from God, how to drift you from a right standing with God, to drift you in a place where you're so far from God that your heart is open for anything. And now when they drift you at a young age, they put you in an environment where you're molested, where you're abused, where your father's not in the home. They put you in a place where drugs is in the house, alcohol's in the house. They put you there so that if they understand they can get your mind so engulfed in that deception, then they have a high percent chance of you producing what your family have produced. A high percentage of producing uh, the, 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 the vile practices that we have in our world today, from sex outside of marriage, from abortions, from homosexuality, whatever it is. These things stem from our hearts being drifted from God. And they understand if I, if I can infiltrate the human mind, allowing them to give me their free will, then I can lure that individual into a place where they're going to eventually regret. That's why they say that <clears throat> God is like, be very careful that you don't observe people's success based upon what's on the outside of them. Don't observe, don't observe their bank accounts. Don't, don't observe the Bentley. Don't observe uh, how many businesses they own. Don't observe those different things because... Let's check their heart. Let's check to see how they get there. Yes, they're knowledgeable. Yes they, yes, they have achieved great things. Yes, they have multiple degrees. But the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. If I fear God, if I reverence him, that's the beginning of all wisdom. Man's wisdom equals nothing. The Bible says he takes the, the, the good things or the, the small things of the world to confound the wise. There's a lot of people who are intellectually strong, uh, brain cells are ticking at 100 miles an hour. They're very smart people, but yet they're morally broken down. God is not, don't base people by all their intellects. Don't look at how smart they are. Look at their actions. Look at their family. Look at how they, look at their lives. Yes, they have everything, but are their lives put together? Let's go a little bit deep. Uh, we see here, it says in verse uh, uh, 14, do not boast and be false to the truth. Many people who, have, who are bitter, they allow their bitterness or their selfish ambition to keep them so caught up on themselves so that they actually boast against the truth. They become prideful. They begin to say, you know what, I don't need God. I'm good here. I built this empire. It was me that built this. And they, they get so consumed against themselves that they boast against the truth. The truth is, is that the wisdom begins with your understanding of God. That's who it is. 
Are, are you in a good right uh, relationship with God? Are you pursuing the things of God? Is this the most focal piece of your life, or is it you producing this empire the focal piece of your life? Many people are boasting against the truth, outwardly. They're, they're looking at front of God saying, God, I don't need you in my life. I don't need you to be a part of me because I have gotten myself here. But the demons have made them look retarded because look at their lives. They're bitter. They're jealous. They have selfish ambition. They, they have families, but their, their success, their, their, drip, their drive to become successful has overdrove or driven over their families. Now their son wants their dad home, but their dad's rarely home. Their daughters want their mom to be there, but their mom is always busy. Look at what this society has produced. Satan understands if I can take you away from the scriptures, if I can take you away from God, if I can drift you from who he is and knowing who he is, you'll become earthly. How many people are hoarding their lives for earth, for this pleasure, this earth? We're guaranteed how many years here? No, no more than 100 for most people. But we invest so much in being so successful here and not understand how can I be successful where I'm going to be eternal? Because one day I'm going to die. Death is, death is the ultimate, not the ultimate, but if death is the most guaranteed thing. The most guaranteed. But many of us are working and living to life as if like we're going to be here forever. The Bible says lay up for yourselves treasures on, don't, don't, lay, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where wrath and must can destroy, or rust, not must, <laughs> where rust can destroy, <laughs> where thieves can break in and steal. But he said, nah, better yet, lay your treasures up in heaven. Nobody can take my treasures in heaven. What treasures do I want to produce? What type of ambition do I want to produce? I want to produce an ambition that's not selfish, but selfless. Where I'm saying, how can I better people? So when I'm dead and gone, I want to leave so much material on this earth that I'm still impacting people after I'm dead and gone. But if I want to hoard everything for myself and become selfish and, and build this empire that only I am, I am going to enjoy, then God's going to be like, why did you even, your life was worth living. Your life wasn't even worth living. Because you got this big house on the hill, you got this success, you got this, all these business, but look at the fruit. You have no fruit. You have no one to live or leave a legacy to. You have nothing. So we have to be very careful of our, our, our drive and what motivates us. What motivates you? What gives you that drive when you wake up? Why do you want to be successful? Why do you want to be able to, 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 to be on a certain platform? What's the reason? Because God's going to be measuring your heart and say, okay, uh, Megan wants to do this because of this. She wants to dance because of this. God knows why Megan wants to dance. God knows why I want to preach. God knows what you want to do. That's why we, it's, it's funny how we hide everything from people. I can hide my, my private things from y'all. I can hide my private issues from y'all. But I want to act like I can hide it from God who sees everything. God knows our motives. God knows our intentions. Satan understands that. He says, you know what, Let's, let me make humanity as bitter and jealous as possible. Let me have humanity so focused on their ambitions that they'll become so selfish that they'll be arrogant, boasting against God, saying, God, I am God. How many people believe they're little gods now? How many people believe that they, that they know the way, that they know the truth, that they know where life is? It's a very sad thing. Let's look at verse uh, 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vow practice. Let's take a look at this. The Bible is showing, here, showing us here in verse 16 the result of jealousy and selfish ambition. It says that there will be disorder. Disorder means, let me get my definitions out. Uh, Oh, disorder, a state of confusion, a lack of order or arrangement, uh, vow practices, morally based, immorally based, or evil, wicked, depraved, sinful, offensive to the sense of the sensibilities, repulsive, disgusting, cheap, and worthless. These are the direct results that Satan wants our lives to be. See, before the fall, before Adam and Eve fell, our whole being was, harm was in harmony. Our spirit and soul and body worked together. The moment that Eve took the bite of the fruit and the moment that Adam chose to follow her, we became in disorder. Our whole body was separated. Our body was driven by the passions of our hearts. And our hearts was driven where our, our spirit man was darkened. The moment that we was detached from God and detached from him in the garden and detached from him, our whole body went into chaos. Our whole being was in disorder. 
And it's with that disorder, Satan understands, if I can make them as bitter, if I can make them jealous, if I can make them selfishly ambitious to achieve greatness in, in, in a way they think greatness is, then they will produce a disorder in their life. You see people with a great portfolio, great business, but their family's in disorder. Their family's in chaos. You have people who have great churches, great ministries, but their family's in chaos. Look at your life today and ask yourself, where there is chaos, you can basically find where that chaos began. Look at your heart. My, our objective is to make sure that we should have everything intact in our lives. Now, we're not going to be perfect, but we should be able to say, okay, from my heart, let me make sure I do everything in decency and in order. Let me make sure that my, my body is working in unison and not in separation of each other. Let's make sure that I'm actually living a life that's holy before God, making sure that I'm walking a life where God can use. Let's continue reading. Let's talk, we just talked about demonic wisdom. We're talking about two types of wisdom, demonic wisdom and God's wisdom. Demonic wisdom is the one that produces selfish ambition, bitter jealousy, that causes us to boast against the truth. This, wis, this type of wisdom, this type of understanding of life becomes, uh, it causes a lot of chaos and vow practice in our lives. Let's look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, impartial, and sincere. Let's look at these different components. Let's look at pure. When you think of pure water, when you think of something that's pure, it's not mixed with any contaminants. That means that that water is not mixed with any type of fluoride or anything like that that's going to make that water impure. When wisdom comes from God, it's first pure because God is pure. See, when God, wants, God says the pure in heart is the ones that will see God, those who have a pure heart, what he's saying is that that heart is not entangled with different contaminants, that that person's heart is not mixed with these influences, these type of pressures. This heart is set aside for God's use. This heart is first pure. That means that, that heart is pure. Whatever that person endeavors to do will not be in disorder. It won't be chaotic. But it'd be a heart that says, you know what, if it's not along the lines of God, if it's not along the lines of God's word, then I cannot operate out of it. When you look at a person's heart, you can tell by their actions what's inside of their heart. If they have actions that's genuine, if they have actions that's really sincere, then you know that God is working on their hearts. But even if you see people that give to the orphanages and give to the poor, but yet they cuss out their wife or they, they cheat on their tax or whatever they do, <clears throat> then it shows you that their heart is really not pure. Let's look at what a pure heart produces. It says, it, uh, or this type of wisdom produced. It says it will make a heart or a person or the actions of a person's life peaceable, gentle. This person is not, when you look at a chaotic person, they're always in arguments. They're always cussing out somebody. They're always aggressive. They don't have no good self-control over their emotions. No control over, over their, uh, uh, their actions. And this person rarely leaves or leaves a peaceable life. This person always causes conflict. This person is always aggressive. This person is always causing some type of disorder. But a person who's using wisdom and applying the word of God for their life, they will leave peace where they go. They won't, uh, their, their actions won't lead to conflict. Their actions won't lead to no chaotic uh, or aggressive type nature. But that person will live a life where, you know what, even if Brandon offends me, even if Brandon gets on my last nerves, I won't look at Brandon as a person I hate Brandon, but I say, you know what? I'm not wrestling against him. I'm not going to allow my life to go against Brandon. I'm going to pray for Brandon and see how God can mend that relationship. You see how that goes. It says open to reason. A lot of people are not open to reason. You can't tell people nothing sometimes. You can't correct people anymore these days. You can't tell them, man, no, that's the wrong way anymore. They're not open to reason because they're selfish, because they got bitterness to say, you know, I don't want to listen to you. I don't care what you got to say, mama. I don't got to care what you say, friend. I'm going to do what I got to do. Because the whole time they've been harboring that bitterness. The whole time they, they're focused on why they want to keep up with the Joneses. And have you ever thought about who the Joneses are? The Joneses don't exist. Many of us are trying to keep up with someone or a group of people on, on an idea that doesn't exist. And if we continue to try to keep up and be jealous of this person, jealous of that person, coveting what this person has, wanting to have this platform, wanting to be famous, then when you get up there, you're not even going to be satisfied with that platform. You're not even going to be satisfied with what that brings. Then you're going to try to be covetous of what Bill Gates has. And if you don't catch up with Bill Gates, you want to achieve greater than what he has. That heart is not content. And that person is not open to reason. 
That person's not allowing the Holy Spirit to say, you know what, that's wrong, Josh. Josh, those motives are wrong. But if I'm arrogant and prideful and bitter and I'm, I'm so caught up on earthly things, unscriptural things and demonic things, then I'm like, Holy Spirit, no, I ain't going to got time to hear what you got to say. I don't read my Bibles to find out what truth is. I, I, I don't, I'm not open to reason. But a person who has real genuine wisdom, their life is almost like an open book. Because you know what? Come, come see what God is doing in my life. This is not about me. I'm open for correction. I'm open for God to check me when I'm doing wrong. I'm open for him to correct me. But if I have a wisdom that streams from a demonic influence or based upon my own intellect, then all of a sudden I don't got, I don't got nothing to do with you. I don't care what you have to say. Let's be very careful with that. It says full of mercy. Turn with me to Matthew uh, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. A person with good wisdom, a person that's really have the wisdom of God, that's really applying their life to what God is saying, this person is full of mercy. Anybody beat me there yet? Oh, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll go ahead and read this. It says, Judge not that you be not... Whoa, my goodness. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when there, is the log, when there is the log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This passage of scripture is very unique. There's a lot of people who don't, who's really not walking, is who are not really merciful. You know, you got super Christians out there that are super saved, and when you see someone walk through the door that has sin in their life or have issues, we judge them. But the whole time, wasn't it God that gave us mercy? Wasn't it God that was like, you know what, I'm patient with you, I'm enduring with you? See, many of us have to understand that we should be full of mercy. That I should be a person that says, you know what, though they affect, though they affect me or though they offend me, I'm still going to be a person that says, you know what, let me walk in mercy with this person. Let me not judge before the time, because how do I not know God is not working in that person's life? How do I not, not, go, how do I not know that God is behind the scenes working to draw that person to them? Instead of judging them, with, with the speck in their eye, let me first take a look at my own life. Let me be so concerned about my own life that I don't have time to worry about somebody else's. And when I take the time to look at my own life and take the logs and all the issues out of my own life, then I will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of my brother's eye. Taking a speck out of our brother and sister's eyes is not based upon, hey, you got issues, let me take this out your eyes. It's more like, you know what? I see the issues. I see where you're heading. Let me walk in wisdom. Let me be full of mercy and let me see how God, how God is going to use me to be merciful to this person. Let's go back to James. We're almost finished. Almost finished. This chair squeak in. Can you hear? Oh, this thing aggravates the mess. Alright. Alright, it continues to read. I'm going to read over again. It says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and it has good fruits. We talked about this a lot last week as far as good fruits. You know, good fruits is the evidence to see if a person is really applying their life to what God has to say. Am I walking with love with everyone? Do I have joy in my life? Am I wrestling against my own anxieties? Am I wrestling against the pressure of this life, or am I giving it all to God and being content in who he is and making him the most centerpiece of my life, and he's the joy of my life? Am I walking in patience? Am I a person that's bearing fruit where I'm patient with my brothers, I'm patient with my sisters, I'm patient with everyone? Yes, it may become frustrating, but am I quick to get back to a place where I can say, you know what, I understand what they're going through, how can I be more patient with them? Let's talk about self-control. Do I have self-control in my life? Am I, am I a person that, that I can control my emotions? Do my emotions control me? Do I control my thoughts? Do my thoughts control me? Do I control what I, what I like and what I enjoy? Do what I like and what I enjoy control me? See, the reason why the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits, uh, plural, is because if you're missing one, it's going to affect the other. If I don't have no peace in my life, it's going to cause me to become uh, overly anxious. It's going to cause me to become 
uh, uh, full of anxiety where I don't, might not show love to everyone. If I lack self-control, if I'm in a situation where my anger rises to a certain level, I'm no longer patient, I no longer walk in peace with people, and I may not be operating full of love. That's why the Holy Spirit endeavors to make sure that every component of that fruit, whole, that whole fruit, is operating at a level where he's moderating each levels of the, the fruit. Make sure that, that love is at a certain level, that joy is at a certain level. Make sure that everything's working together. And so he's also saying that those who walk in genuine wisdom produce that fruit. Let's keep going. Uh, impartial. Uh, a person who doesn't show any favors. Talked about this about two or three weeks ago. That I'm not a racist. That I love every race equally. That I don't, I don't look over the poor to, 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 to just and jive for the rich. That I love the rich and the poor the same. That I, I'm equally, my heart is open to make sure I take care of both of the rich and the poor, all races equally. Because God is impartial. How can I sit there and say I love this person more than this person when God doesn't view us that way? All right, let's look at the last one. It says sincere. A person who is genuine is a person who is sincere. I'm going to labor on this for a little bit. Ask yourself today, how sincere are your motives? How genuine are you? Do you ask yourself what, what are the reasons why you do what you do? Because it, the way, the reason or the motives behind what you do will show you exactly what your heart is. If I'm only doing this for money, if I'm only doing this because I want to pack out seats, or if I'm only doing this so my, I can have a bunch of Twitter followers or a bunch of stuff on my Facebook, then obviously this will burn up when I'm in judge with, with God. Everything that I'm doing now will be burnt up because it wasn't genuine. It wasn't from a heart that says, you know what, I love the people, not the platform. and we check the reason why we do certain things, we'll be in a better position. I won't be coming to Gerald only for something. I won't be coming for Gerald for only for money. I'll be coming for him because I love Gerald, that I'm his brother. We have to ask ourselves what our motives are. Why do we do what we do? See, James is a series of tests, and this is one of our tests to see. Is what we're doing in life streaming from demonic influence or a God's influence? Let's pray. <laughs> March in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never fly over the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. You're listening to an Asbreezy yeah. Entertainment production. Shalom. Asbreezy on the beat. East Sean Burger D. Salvation Army. I just want to let y'all know it's no if ands, no buts, no maybes on this thing, no commas, just periods, no compromise, yeah. I hope y'all praying for me sincerely The times pain can appear to be so near me But we grow not weary and what we're doing is clearly a test Let me bless your earpiece Some of us got stress and hard luck But us in the city boys ain't never giving God up Squad up, Salvation Army men Suited up as soon as he dismissed me, I'm going in Raise your hand if you're present in the hood Nowadays hard to even make 11 in the hood Some try to do good, but the number keeps Growing, we straight shots need a leash on them. Man, I tell them boys on the block if they really hate the cops, they'll stop bringing them around.